Hey, Casey. Casey Liss, welcome to IS16. How are you keeping? I am well. How are you? I'm really good. I'm really good. Now, I did sort of mention this to you just before we got going, that it's it's kind of, I should play this call, but I still find it really, I don't know, like another dimension. I'm sitting here now talking to you in my place, in your place, <laughs> and your voice must have kept me company for I don't know how many miles when I've been out doing cardio in the mornings. Yep, so yep. It's, it's really weird to hear you in my headphones. Yeah, it's 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 odd for it to be interactive, isn't it? Because I've mm. had plenty of experiences where I've listened to a show and and even if it's a friend that I know in real life, oftentimes the experience of having like a one to one conversation when you're not used to that is really like mind blowing and it can kind of throw you off your game. So uh, I, I totally understand if, if you fumble here and there, because I know that when I've been in your shoes, it's been a total mind. It, it's, a mind so, it's, yeah, it's a mind game. It really is. But no, from now on, I'm going to act profession. Well, profession. <laughs> well, I'm not. So we're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, I first got to know you via your podcast. We're going to talk about that mm -hmm. at length a lot later on but uh before i mean apple kind of did the great algorithmic thing of throwing that show at me from all of the listening i do to is that right geeky yeah yeah, yeah. it's them that, that threw it up to me um mm. and i that's how i've clearly got to know you and the guys on the show but uh what was your background as a kid i'm taking it you were probably something into electronics and you were liking fiddling and playing and yeah, yeah. So uh, my dad, for the vast majority of my life, worked for IBM, and he always had computers in the house because of his job. You know, that was kind of his thing for a long time. Um, and he was always a tinker when he before he worked for IBM, there was a brief window of time that he was a professional mechanic. And um, and on account of that. He definitely had stuff around the house and was always tinkering and was always messing about with stuff. And when I was really little, I remember, I don't remember how old I was, but I would always ask dad, like, hey, how do I go into such and such game in DOS, you know, in the old operating system? How do I go into this? How do I do this? How do I do that? And he would always help me. But after a while, my dad, for all of his many uh, wonderful qualities, he is not a patient man. And eventually <laughs> he was just like, just, just. Just read the book. Just read the book already, would you? And and I was like, what? And he literally, at like ten years old, told me to read the DOS owner's manual. And I don't, I don't think I can grab it from where I'm sitting, but, but somewhere off it. camera. I I many many years later, um, I did a keynote at a local conference, and just for grins and giggles, I was like, I wonder if I can get my hands on. I think it was the DOS 3.3 owner's manual. It was a blue book. Um, at some point, I'll have to maybe send you a picture if I remember. But anyways, but I read the DOS owner's manual, which at 10 years old was interesting to read. But um, but it really just kind of clicked that, oh, this is something I'm really, really interested in. And then um, on account of dad working for IBM, I he often would give me like ancient computers to use. So when I was... I think it was like 10 ish around the same time maybe it was a little older um he had given me like an old 8088 pc like the original ibm pc this is when i think the pentium was like the modern processor at the time so this is an old computer old, yeah. but he set he set it up in my room like and so you couldn't do squat with it like the internet i think barely existed at that point and and <laughs> certainly we weren't on it at that point um and so there was it was a much less dangerous thing to do than like sitting a computer in a today 11 year old's mm -hmm. room you know mm -hmm. what i mean but mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, but I remember vividly, I built this like, uh, complete, uh, menu system to launch like games and whatnot. That was all driven by like auto exec bat. And I remember it was like this garish red background with like yellow, like ASCII art, like, uh, boxes all around. And it was, it was truly terrible, but that was like my first real exposure to programming to some degree. And that, that it all kind of uh, snowballed from there, I guess. And I can, I give you the long and drawn out story from there, but suffice to say, I went to college for computer engineering, um, and, and studied in computer engineering is like half electrical engineering, half computer science, and then just started working as a developer from there and kind of fell into podcasting accidentally. So the, <laughs> accidental, the, the accidental. Yeah, <laughs> didn't even so, mean it that way. But. <laughs> you know, you got the brand on the shirt as well. I mean, you're right, all right, right, right. Up. Oh, it's, yeah, it's yeah, good. It's good. It. I'm it liking this. Right. The next step, I should really think about doing something clever like that. So the uh, the, the degree you got at college in was that actually useful day to day in what you went on to do? Uh, you know, it's funny you ask. Yes, asterisk. Um, I, I roomed for my uh, junior and senior years. I roomed with a, a guy that was a double E, uh, an electrical engineer. And he's really, really smart and an incredible work ethic. And I don't remember how we were talking about it, but one, one day we were talking to each other and he said, you know what, I'm getting an engineering degree, you know, because it sets me up well for, you know, getting a job and so on and so forth. But, but really, I'm getting a degree to prove that I know how to learn. 
And that mm-hmm. was the first I had heard somebody say that to me. And it's probably not an original composition on this guy's part, but it was the first time I had heard somebody say that to me. And it was really like a mind blown sort of a moment where it occurred to me, yeah, that is kind of why I'm here. And mm-hmm. So to answer your question more directly, like, yes, you know, being a professional developer, which I was and sort of still am, uh, that did set me up for it. But a surprising amount of my day to day at my first job involved things that I knew nothing about from school, like simple things like version control. So if you happen to be familiar, like GitHub is, you know, how you would know a version control where basically, you know, you're storing your, your code somewhere and you're checking it out, making changes and then pushing those changes back to a server somewhere. Like I never dealt with that in college, which I don't know, maybe is, maybe is a, a slight on my university, but one way or another, like at that point, this was in the early aughts, that wasn't really something that was often taught in university. And so, you know, I get to the real world and they're starting to tell me about version control and I'm kind of like, um, what, what are we talking about here? And so, yes, it did set me up because I knew how to write code, but there was so much of being an adult and doing an honest to goodness job that I was just completely clueless about and went right over my head. It's so often the way, isn't it? The, the, the degrees that, and the studying you do doesn't get you ready for the commercial world and what they expect right, of you exactly. in a commercial environment day to day. Using one of your famed phrases from your podcast, the jobby job is when yeah, you're yeah, in, exactly. doing yep. an actual job. So you, you didn't go straight into being self employed. You went to work no, in the commercial no, no, sector, no. did you? Mm-hmm. And yeah, the, so I, I was I was self, or I was employed employed with a jobby job from oh four through twenty eighteen. So it's fourteen years. At the same place? Or? No, goodness. No, no <laughs> goodness. No, I, I bounced, I bounced around a fair bit, which is funny. Cause my, my, as I said earlier, my dad worked for IBM for like 30, 35 years, maybe, mm. maybe even, I don't think he hit 40, but it was 30 plus. Mm. And so even my dad's generation, you know, he's, uh, almost 70, I believe. I think that's right. Um, in, in his generation, you know, it was not unusual to just be a lifer, you know, wherever. And, and for me, I had was something like five or six jobs over the span of those 14 years. You know, I, I think the longest place I'd stayed was, about four years and most of them were like two ish give or take a little bit so um i wasn't against staying somewhere for a while but it was a far cry from you know what what i had grown up with where dad was an ibmer forever so i'm thinking uh, i i don't know an awful lot about the the world of app development and an app developer's Mm -hmm. job but i'm assuming it's a a, quite a creative task and Mm -hmm. talking to you just a moment ago i was thinking it's got to be quite hard picking up on somebody else's app and dream (laughs) and trying to give that some life and love it, it is. Um, I was only doing iOS apps professionally in the most recent jobby job. So that was 2016 through 2018. It was, a, I think, about two and a half years. Mm-hmm. Um, before that, it was other kinds of code, normally web related, but not exclusively. Actually, my first job out of school, um, coming back to our DOS conversation, my first job out of college was uh, working on slot machines. Well, kind of, that were um, destined for Native American casinos. So because of odd American laws, um, Native, Amer- like Native American reservations could oftentimes pass their own rules with regard to gambling. Mm-hmm. And because of that, there were places, and, th- and th- these particular machines were going to Oklahoma, uh, which is just north of Texas, um, there were places where you could have gambling at an at an a Native American reservation that it wouldn't be legal anywhere around it. And what we, what the company had realized is you can have a person play bingo, but you could represent the bingo game as reels on a slot machine. So you're, you're pulling a lever and the reels are spinning, but the reels are simply doing what the bingo game or, or displaying the results of the bingo game, if you will. So if you do really well in bingo, you get, you know, three cherries or whatever the case may be. Yeah. But if you don't do well at bingo, then you get, you know, a, a bunch of a mixed nothing. And in you, there was actually a little LCD up at the top of the slot machine that showed your bingo board. So if you didn't know better, you think you're playing a regular slot machine but in reality you're playing like this networked game of bingo it was all absolutely bananas and it was very very weird and the reason this is relevant to my earlier story is because all these machines ran dos this is 2004 mm. like mm. dos was long gone at gone. this yeah, point yeah, yeah. but all these yeah. machines were running dos i was writing code in a watcom c plus plus uh, compiler which was like ancient at the time um it was it was a very odd transition and so yeah so for that was my initial job and i was there for a couple of years and then i went to do um um, some some stuff for uh, a defense contractor and then just various web related jobs for a long time but to come back to your question from 30 minutes ago <laughs> <laughs> it is it is a creative endeavor um and it is very unusual to 
look at somebody else's code and try to piece together like mm. what were they thinking why did they do it you know what what is this about but the the interesting and challenging thing is you realize after a couple of years and after you're doing it for a while that the the way you look at another developer's code 10 minutes after they wrote it is the same way you look at your own code two years after you wrote it like what was i thinking what is this about how did this ever work and you could say that as much about your own code as yep. you could about somebody else's and so you come to realize especially as you get older like you know a kid's um a, a kid a young coder's uh, ideas to build new like always just build new build new build new sh shiny fancy use the latest techniques and so on and so forth but as you get older and, and I don't know, grizzled as a developer, as you, <laughs> as you get a little gray hair, you start to realize that functional code beats any code. And even if it's a spaghetti mess, it's still functional. And that's the in, in the end of the day, that's what counts. Right. You know, right, it, yeah. it doesn't matter. Like if, if the fidelity of this video recording isn't perfect, that doesn't really matter. What matters is that we have successfully recorded a video. And and it's a similar thing. Right. Where if the code is out there and it's working, that's what matters, even if under the under the covers, it looks like a complete jumbled mess. So uh, I don't know if this question is going to be answerable or not, but I'll run past it. I say knowing nothing about app development. How does it kind of start? If we look, obviously, we're talk, centering on iOS because we're both kind mm. of Macy guys. Um, from c conception through to delivery, I, mm. I know that's a big question, but how does it start? I mean, would it be simply say if I was a client and I'd phoned you up and said, I've got this idea, mm. I want uh, an audio app of some sort? Yeah. Do you then begin to sort of piece together something based on knowledge that you've got, or is every single project very, very individual? Yes, <laughs> it's both. Um, I think for me, and every every developer is different, right? And and I don't know anything about art, but um, I feel like you know, does some artists maybe start with a pencil or something like that, and then kind of try to get the the broad strokes, pardon the pun, mm -hmm. the broad strokes of the picture squared away, and then come back with like ink or paint or whatever. And it's kind of like that for me with an app. Um, if I'm doing it for somebody else or like part of a job then I definitely would do a lot of like what, you know, the business term for this is discovery, but I would do a lot of like, what are you looking for? What does it need to do? How does it need to do it? What are the, what are the affordances we need to provide for, you know, the particular uh, cust customer that you're trying to reach or, or client that you're trying to reach. And there's a lot of discovery. Um, and and a, a lot of times I try to, I would try to do as much as I could up front within reason to at least understand the problem space as well as I could, uh, particularly when I'm working on something that's outside of my normal realm. Um, it's important for me to understand like what, what solution are we providing? Why are we mm -hmm. providing it, et cetera. Um, but for me, when I'm doing something independently, it, you know, I am the client. I'm, I am, I don't know if you guys had these silly commercials over there, but like, you know, the hair growth commercials, I, I'm not only the president, I'm also a client. Um, <laughs> yeah, we got them. So, uh, it, so it's kind of like that, right? And so um, when I have a new idea, typically the first thing I do is see if I can get the, the, like the, the, the complicated or, or new to me thing. Can I get a proof of concept of that working immediately? So my most recent app is called Masquerade. I was going to talk about that, it, yeah. Yeah, and, and the idea of it in short is I wanted to be able to post pictures of my kids, but I'm a little finicky about I, I really don't love putting pictures of their faces on the Internet. But I wanted to capture yeah. like a family, a family moment. Mm -hmm. And so what I found myself doing was like sticking emoji over their face. Actually, I should have grabbed one of those pillows back there, but, <laughs> I, but sticking emoji over their faces. And it occurred to me that at WWDC, which is the big uh, summertime Apple conference where they release like new um, APIs and stuff, mm -hmm. it occurred to me that they have machine learning where ostensibly it could detect where a face is. Mm -hmm. And if I can detect where a face is, then shouldn't I be able to throw an emoji right on top of there? And so I don't have any visual aids. I'd need to do better about like capturing in progress work. Um, but what I basically did was make the ugliest app in the world that just put a square over a face because I'd never used this API. Once I got the square over the face, okay, we're making progress. Now can we put an emoji over the face? And okay, now that the emoji is over the face, can we you know tap and drag and move the emoji around and so on? And can we pinch to zoom and and then over time you start to have something that's functional but hideous 
And then once you get something that's functional but hideous, then the the, the remaining 90% is spit polishing to make it not hideous anymore. <laughs> um, and that's how I approach it, but everyone's different. And some people, they're more visual thinkers and they want to do the design first and just fake out the, you know, the complicated bits uh, or, well, you know, the, 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 uh, the user interaction, they may, may, may be fake out. Uh, and, and then they'll come back and do the, okay, well, how do I figure out where a face is? You know, and that, but that's not how I work. I want to get through, can I, can I find the face? Can I uh, obscure the face? And then from there, I can worry about making it look pretty. So you almost try to get the nuts and bolts to bed first, mm -hmm. knowing that, exactly. that, that the end product will work or can work and then sort of right. make it look pretty. Yeah, and because to my eyes, like if, if I can't get, and I'm picking on this example just because it's a really great illustrative example, like if I can't get an emoji over a face, yeah. it doesn't matter how beautiful the app is. Like it's yeah. not really serving its purpose. Not doing its job. If I, it, exactly. If I can't get the, the nuts and bolts, like you said, the, 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 the nitty gritty working straight away. Mm. And with an app, I was, clearly I was looking at the app yesterday before speaking to you, and yep. an app like that, how long would that take mm -hmm. to develop? Uh, you know, I, I, mean, it I should stall for time. It, 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 you know, it, it's complicated and it's not, I don't know. It, it took me a while for sure. I'm trying to stall for time as I'm looking on GitHub where I store <laughs> all of this code and I'm trying to figure out. So the advantage of, of you know, using something like GitHub is it, it keeps a record of, of all the time. Like a job code yep. and, yeah, exactly. And so it was 261 commits is how many times I've checked in code. Now that doesn't mean 261 changes. That's 261 times that I've uploaded Upload. A, a group of code and made at least one change. Mm. So it looks like I started the app about a year ago, actually. It was almost to the day. It was September 21st of 2021. Uh, my first was my first commit for Masquerade. And so that was uh, that was the very first commit. And I released it, I think it was like March-ish, mm -hmm. April, something like that. I forget exactly when I released it. I should know this off the top of my head. It's like, you know, not knowing your kid's birthday. But uh, it was sometime, <laughs> it was sometime one, so early this year. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, so it was sometime early-ish this year. I, I think I have releases in here somewhere. I can look it up. But it, so to answer your question more directly, it was something like between three and six months, something like that, maybe six-ish months. But I mean, that wasn't working, you know, 40 hours a week, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. always, always, always. I have other things going on, as we may end up talking about. So mm -hmm. uh, it was six-ish months at probably, you know, half to three-quarters time that I spent on this app. Um, so it's it's not nothing, but it's not, you know, a three-year endeavor or anything like that. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get a handle on. I wasn't sure where, mm -hmm. you know, which end of that scale it, it would sit. And yep. how thoroughly can you beta test before? I'm never sure it's beta or beta. I can never tell <laughs> on the correct <laughs> pronunciation. It, if you believe in the Queen's English, it's usually beta. Uh, but for me, it's well, beta. Uh, being but, bright, uh, you know, I should really be saying beta then, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, I do my best. So, obviously, I use the app. But the problem with that is you're too close to it. And mm. so um, usually what I'll do is I'll get the app to the point that I'm not actively embarrassed by it. And then I'll have my wife start using it. And she's really good at coming up with ways that I didn't even think of that, mm. that you know, somebody may want to use the app. And then once she gets a, the hold of it and has gotten to the point that she's, you know, th she says it's okay. Um, then Apple has a service that they bought called test flight. And what you can do is you can send oh, a build to test flight. Yeah, yeah. I it didn't used to be. It started as an independent thing, and then they, excuse me, and then they bought it up. Um, so yeah, th that's an Apple uh, thing. It's kind of an app, kind of a service. And what you can do is you can upload your app to Test Flight, and you can invite beta, beta testers. Now, a beta tester, where did that come from? I'm like, I'm trying to cross the streams here. Uh, but you can invite beta beta you. testers. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, but you can invite testers to come in, and they can download the app. It's kind of almost like a, the App Store, but it's it's limited. You know, so mm -hmm. you you have to have permission, if you will, uh, in order to to test the app. And then I'll usually send that to like a handful of friends um, to start when it's when it's only mildly embarrassing. And then they'll tell me, you know, oh, this doesn't work. You should look at this. You should fix that, et cetera. And then I'll expand it to a little bit wider audience, not like public, but, you know, maybe some press, maybe some I don't mean this flippantly, but like broader friends, you know, not mm. my best friends in the whole wide world, but, you know, people that I value their opinion, but they're not like my core group. 
yeah, uh, and yeah. then I'll usually have them try it for a few weeks as I'm finishing up the UI, trying to make sure everything's buttoned up and, and pretty as I want it to be. And then at some point, you know, uh, my friend underscore David Smith, um, underscore being his nickname, because uh, his his Twitter handle is literally underscore David Smith. Well, anyways, because <laughs> uh, I realize that your audience may not know who the heck I'm talking about. But uh, anyway, he he is very good about and he's talked a lot, often about that he'll just and I'm the same way. We'll just keep iterating, 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 iterating and never ship. And so uh, he'll get himself to the point that he'll you know literally print out a, she uh, a sheet of paper that has a little emoji ship on it and it says no new features and at some point you know you kind of rein yourself in and say all right I got to get this out the door otherwise I'm just gonna sit here for the rest it's until the end of time and just continue to test and tweak and test and tweak uh, and and so that's eventually what you have to do and you know I've never released an app where I'm like it's perfect. You know, it's, mm. it's nothing, no, no, no changes needed, nothing to be done. And I could give you a list on both of my apps of things I should and want to do, but at some point you just got to get it out and see if it has any legs and see if it, see if it's worthwhile. On the last podcast that I did, actually, I had a musician on and I said, who released an album not that long ago. And mm. I, the question to him was very similar. I said, when is an album ever finished? And he kind of just roared and said, you know, it never is. But at some yeah. point you just have to send it off for mastering and think mm -hmm. job's done and we've got to move on. And it's obviously very much the same in your world as well. Well, yes, asterisk, because I have the ability of re-releasing that album, if you will, as yeah, many yeah, times as I want, as often as I want, which I think for a musician, I reckon that's a far taller order to do something like that, you know. Unless you do a remix and a single, yeah. In my yeah. old English, the 12-inch was kind of there for good, but now it's much, much easier. I'm pointing <laughs> for audio listeners. I'm, I'm <laughs> pointing at my collection of vinyl behind my shoulder yeah, at the moment. Yeah. Um, yes, I am of that age. And an indelicate question, you can answer as directly or as indirectly as mm. you, you wish. How does one make money out of app development? Because <laughs> they are dirt cheap on the whole to buy. Even the expensive yeah. ones are cheap when you think that somebody, you know, has spent a yep. year of their life invested into it. So yeah. commercially, how, I mean, I'm assuming you take on third party commercial work as well as doing your own work. Not exactly. So I'm lucky enough that, you know, so I had a jobby job and we need to kind of go through a little bit of history for this to make mm, sense. So I had the jobby job and then um, I had had have a couple of friends of mine of one of one of whom is Marco Arment. And mm -hmm. uh, your listeners, if they don't know who he is, would know him as the co-founder of Tumblr, the website Tumblr. Um, and I've known Marco since we were like 10 years old or something like that. I forget exactly when we met, but we were really, really little. And Marco had a pretty popular podcast, at least in our neck of the woods, um, called Build and Analyze with a gentleman by the name of Dan Benjamin. And um, Marco had decided to end Build and Analyze. And I had been needling him like, hey, man, we both really like cars. Like, let's do a show about cars. Why not? It'll be fun and casual and silly because we we like cars. We don't really know crap about cars. So <laughs> it'll be fun and, and silly and whatnot. And, and, he, and eventually after needling him for a while, he was like, you know what? Maybe we should do that. But I know this guy. And at this point, I, so Marco said, I know this guy. And at this point, I kind of knew uh, John Syracuse, who you probably don't know your listeners might not know unless you're super super big apple nerds but um he used to write these like novel length reviews of each version of mac os that came out which is a very nerdy thing to do but we're three nerds what are you going to do um well, anyway so marco said yeah, exactly. <laughs> right right and so marco had the genuinely brilliant idea and he said you know what john likes cars like let's invite him to to do it too and because john had coincidentally also just ended his own program called uh, excuse me called uh, hypercritical which is are, I mean, my book, one of the best podcasts ever, like it, yeah, it takes the right mind to enjoy it. But if you're in that world, like it was phenomenal it, and it mm. holds up. I haven't listened to an episode in a long time, but last I had tried, it holds up surprisingly well for being like a tech news show. So anyway, so in 2013, the three of us start this show neutral, which was the car podcast. And it turns out like, because they each had a following, you know, our initial episode made a pretty big splash, but, um, the, the, the listenership, like it just plummeted almost immediately because we don't really know that much about cars. Like we know more than your average Joe, but we don't know that much. And, and it was fun. Like I, I will always view neutral as like my first love, right. You know, like your high school sweetheart, if you will, because I had so much fun doing it and it broke me into podcasting. Yeah. But it wasn't successful. Like we had sponsors, we made a little bit of money over off of it, but it wasn't it wasn't successful by most metrics. But in another brilliant move by Marco, uh, he he, there were the three of us would talk for a little while after we finished recording the show, and of course because we're three developers, we started talking about nerdy stuff. Mm -hmm. And Marco 
on a on a lark released a couple of these on soundcloud so this is now bringing in the musicians of the world like legitimately atp which is the podcast i'm wearing the shirt if you happen mm. to be watching the video no you can't see it but it's over here somewhere <laughs> anyways uh the atp the accidental tech podcast that started on soundcloud it really honestly did because marco released a couple of uh chats that we had about i think the very first one might have been about having a bigger iphone because this was 2013 um and it turned out that people like really enjoyed the three of us talking about tech because, hey, that's what we do. That's mm -hmm. what we know. Uh, and, and over time, we realized, well, neutral is a bomb. Like, we enjoy it. We love it. But it's, it's, it's not, not going to go anywhere. Well. It's not going to go anywhere. But ATP, that thing has legs. And so we pivoted over to ATP and you know, we retired neutral, which was always designed to be a mini series anyway. And we started doing ATP. And that was, we really, really embraced it, I think, in April of 2013. And so now it's coming on almost 10 years that we've been doing it. So to come back to the question, you know, I had started earning money from ATP as I was doing my jobby jobs. And by the time I really decided to embrace app development, I had, I, I, well, I think peak of you was not out at that point in my own history. I'm, I'm crossing the streams off when, Which what happened you, when, you love app, yeah. Right? Yeah, the, the, what peak of you is the first app that I'd, or no, Vignette. Well, I forgot about Vignette, which I've since retired. So, what was that one? One way or another. So, Vignette, well, the idea about behind Vignette was if you, the user, put in like Twitter handles in your contacts in the Apple Contacts app, mm -hmm. Vignette would then look at that and go to Twitter and say, okay, I'm going to grab this person's avatar on Twitter and stuff it into your contact card. So, people would have pictures yeah, yeah. Um, so rather than just like CL or yes, you know, whatever yes, the case yes, may be. Yeah. Um, and that worked really well, and that actually earned me a pretty good, a, a pretty decent sum of money, and we'll talk about how in a second. But uh, because of changes on Facebook and Twitter side and whatnot, they really didn't love anyone, not just me, scraping their site for like photos and whatnot. And I was doing it, I think, in as least gross, in, in the in the least gross way possible. But nevertheless, I'm still looking at their site and taking pictures from it and so on and so forth. And I wasn't doing like anything privacy conscious. Like everything I was grabbing was publicly available. It's not like I was, you know, doing some sort of weird sign in dance or anything like that. But nevertheless, because of changes on all of these websites side, I ended up retiring vignette, not too terribly long, like a year after I, I had released it, because it just wasn't working well. And to, to make it work well would have required vast changes in what the app did. So I'm sorry, I'm on like the tangent of a tangent of a tangent. But so, um, so Vignette, that made a pretty big splash. And I think in part because it was fairly universally applicable. And I actually got a, a post on TechCrunch about it. Um, which in our world is a very, 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 very popular website. And it was front page on TechCrunch for a little while. And I made a pretty decent sum of money off of it. It wasn't like a year's salary, but it was mm. pretty good. Mm. Um, and, and, and at this point, like ATP is earning me as much as my jobby job. So in, in the middle of 2018, I actually left, you know, traditional jobby job employment. Um, we had uh, an infant at the time. And then my son was what, three and a half ish, something like that. Um, and I thought, you know, if I'm going to do something stupid, let's do it now when the kids are home. And little did I know a pandemic is about to happen and they're really going to be home. But let's do it now when the kids are home. And let me be present for this time. And then my my goal was for to last until my son entered kindergarten, which coincidentally was the fall of 2020. And so I thought at that point, he'll be out of the house. And not that I don't care about my daughter, but at least I've been there for some amount of time, you know, with 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 them. And then my reach goal is can I last until my daughter's in kindergarten? And if I can make it work, if we can not be stupid with money, if I can mm -hmm. survive on just the podcasts, can I make that work? And can I do it until my daughter Michaela is in college? And if or in college, goodness, college. In, in kindergarten, <laughs> uh, and if I can way. do that, right? Uh, if I could do that, then then at that point, like they're out of the house all day anyway, I can get a job again, be a be a real adult, and that's no problem. And so. I, all of this is relevant to your question because I had ATP already and, and I had that income to live off of. If I was living off of only app development, I would have to do exactly what you said. I would either need to take on clients or I would need to have much bigger, a much bigger splash than I had. And, you know, underscore David Smith that we talked about earlier, part mm -hmm. of the way that he is able to do what he does is he releases apps like hourly. It seems like he's, he's got like he's 60 beast. apps in the store or, some, or, or had 60 apps in the store. And it turns out that, um, you might know Underscore because of Widgetsmith, which was hugely popular a year or two ago um, when widgets were added to the home screen on iOS because he made a really clever app that lets you customize them. And people were using it to 
to you know make their home screens look totally different. And for him, it wasn't TechCrunch that got him his big break. It was a it was it became his app became super popular on TikTok, and he just became this huge splash on TikTok. Not him personally, like his app was yeah, this yeah. major splash on TikTok. And so to answer your question, like you can make a living on just apps. But it, it takes a lot and it usually takes somebody outside of your bubble realizing it so that you're you're getting like honest to goodness, real coverage from somewhere broader. And th I had that with Vignette on TechCrunch. D Dave got that on TikTok. Uh, Marco had that by oh, because he's Marco and, and over time with Overcast, which Overcast, is my preferred yeah, sure. uh, way to listen to podcasts on, on iPhones. And so if you can break out of a bubble it can it can work it can be a thing but it's it, it's it, it takes you know lightning in a bottle to do it that's what makes it hard so obviously that's explained really well to me that the, the main element of your working week then is actually the podcast atp and the apps well, are kind it, of the cream on, on top so this is this is like the debate i've been having with myself for the last year or two and I, i've talked with my my dear friend mike hurley who is from london um we have a podcast called analog that we do together which is i never really came up with a good elevator pitch for it but it's kind of just our feelings podcast because we do a lot of tech podcasts and so mm -hmm. this is our feelings podcast where we just talk about other stuff and which i know is a terrible elevator pitch but it's good i promise um but anyway you know he said to me on a, on an episode i don't know like six months maybe a year ago you realize that you're not an app developer right i was like what so you're you're not an app developer like yeah i know you, that's how you spend a lot of your time but that's not where a lot of your money's coming from like whether or not you believe it you're a podcaster bud it's mm. like no no well no uh hmm you know you might be right about that actually <laughs> and so um so yeah so in terms of time my time is spent doing app development but in terms of income it's not the apps that are making the money it's the podcast so let's begin talking about atp then which is where i first mm -hmm. Ages back, I said, it's where I first heard you. <laughs> and uh, the podcast I know from when I was listening to it the last weekend has just reached the milestone of 500 yeah. episodes. Yep. Now, trust me, sort of having dipped my I, I think I said before we start recording that my background was in radio. So I've uploaded a fair number of shows, but I can honestly say that uh, to have 500 episodes of a tech podcast takes some doing. You've not missed a week in almost 10 years. Is that right? Yeah. So again, I think it was April ish that we dedicated ourselves like this is a thing now. And it was so April of 2013. And since that time, we have never missed a week. Um, and it's been, you know, 495 weeks or something like that, whatever it's been. And of the, and the three of us have been on every show except one, like a lot of other podcasts, including many of our peers, they'll have guests and, and that's mm -hmm. fine. Like, I'm not mm -hmm. trying to say there's anything wrong with that, but it was one of those things where like, we just kind of built momentum. Mm. And then now we just kind of don't want to ruin the streak. It's like your stupid Apple watch with your rings on your watch, right? Like you don't want to ruin your streak. Uh, and so we've done some pretty big gymnastics, particularly around summertime where we're, well, where we'll record like two or three episodes in a single week, which when you're a news focused program can be a little bit daunting and challenging, Risky, especially yeah. over summertime when there's not a lot of news to go around to begin with, but we've made it work. And, and yeah, there was one episode where we did like a crossover thing with a few friends of ours and John was substituted for our good friend, Christina Warren, um, who I think was at Mashable at the time. She's at GitHub now, coincidentally, mm. previously from Microsoft. She's phenomenal. She's an incredible podcaster and, and you should, you, both you and your listeners should check out Rocket on Relay FM, uh, which is a really great show as well. But anyways, uh, we did a, a host swap with rocket i believe it was with rocket actually where um you know christina came on our show and and i think marco and i went on an episode of rocket if memory serves this was years ago now and so john missed that episode but it was a deliberate choice but other than that in 500 episodes we've been in every one uh marco had one where he had lost his voice and so he used like uh, text or type to type to speech uh, for, uh, for here and there. And like his wife, Tiff, stepped in and, and did the show for the most part. But he was there, like strictly speaking. I think you could hear him croak a couple of times. <laughs> but but yeah, we've not missed an episode in, in like almost 10 years now. No, I mean, it's possible that, you know, many people listening to this or watching this won't understand the commitment that any kind of podcast and recording, particularly when mm -hmm. you're doing it with, in your case, two other people takes that mm -hmm. commitment to time of all being at the same place at the same time 
committing yeah. to that time to record each week. And of course, then there's the time in post of just making it sound good, yep. getting uploaded. It all takes time. In fact, something I really should ask you, I'll just come to mind. Your album mm. art changes on the podcast with chapters. <laughs> yeah. I'm fascinated, fascinated yeah. as to how you do that. What do you, what program are you using for that to work So through? that... So I am a diva when it comes to podcasting and not deliberately, but it just kind of happened that way insofar as I've literally never edited a show ever. I, of all the shows I've ever been on, I've never once cracked open Logic or GarageBand or anything like that to edit a show. Um, so Marco, in the case of ATP, does all of the editing and it's his baby. And I, I don't mean that dismissively. Like he really cares yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and really spends time on it. Yeah, the and video quality so, is stunning. Well, I appreciate that. And thank you. And, and, you know, Marco is a huge audiophile and not that I don't care, but you know, I, I don't have quite as discerning an ear as, as Marco does. Um, well, anyways, so, uh, in fact, actually for, for those who are watching, there's a door over my shoulder that typically I leave open because one time, like eight, six months, a year ago, there you go. It's over my shoulder. Yes, there, other yep. side. Um, oh. anyways, like six months, a year ago, um, the closet door I had closed probably for a video show or something like that. And uh, the, uh, after Marco edited the show, he was like, you changed something. It's like, no, what? No, I didn't. It's the same room I've been in for years. You've changed. No, you've changed something. Acoustically. He wasn't like angry. Yeah. 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 And he wasn't like angry about it, but he was like, I'm telling you, you changed something and I don't like it. Like we can, what can we do to fix whatever you did? And it took a couple hours, like going back and forth in a happy way. We were going back and forth. I was like, I mean, maybe my laptop lid was open. Like, I don't know. Did I use a glass this time instead of like a little water bottle thing? And then it occurred to me, oh. I left the garage, the garage, the, the <laughs> closet doors closed, and that's what it was. And I, and you can that tell me, I don't think I idea. sound uh, right, exactly. So I don't think I sound that acoustically different than no. normal. No, no. But he could tell enough that I don't know, maybe the echo was different, or it was it was reverberating in a weird way. Mm -hmm. Whatever it was, he could tell. And so after we are done recording this, I will open those those closet <laughs> doors once again, so I don't forget. But yeah, to to come back to what you were saying, like on the one side, I. I we we are able all three of us are now independent we are able to make a living off of talking to our friends and and i don't want to lose sight of the fact that we are incredibly incredibly lucky and blessed to be able to say that mm. but that being said it's not just you know oh we we show up and blab for 10 you know or an hour or two and then walk away um i all of us put in a, a decent amount of work figuring out what we're going to talk about each episode um Hopefully John less than the others because he burnt out on his prior show from doing too much uh, preparation. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, all three of us do prep. Uh, Marco takes in tremendous care in editing the show, and he uses an, an app that he has written. I believe it's called Forecast. I'm probably I might have that wrong, but I believe it's called Forecast. I should shoot now. Now I'm having second thoughts, but I can look it up and I can give you a link for your show notes. Mm -hmm. But he has an app where you can drop chapters and in, in, in the in the edited version of the file, you can drop chapters or maybe he takes the chapters out of logic, actually. But you can go in and edit the album art for each individual chapters. And it makes it super, super straightforward to do that. And the app is available um, for anyone to download. It's one of those things where he built it for himself and he's released it to the world, but he has zero interest in supporting it, which I totally get. Like, you know, so if you have bugs or whatever, you can tell him and he's probably going to say, okay, but, <laughs> um, but yes, yeah. yeah, that's as far as, that's as far as we go. But the, there is an app that he has written to do that. And, and that's just an example, a silly example of a way in which we care. And mm. uh, you know, it, not everything that one cares about becomes popular or can earn money, but all three of us care very, very much about the show. And we have for 10 years. And I like to think that that shows. It shows in the fact that we never miss an episode. It shows in the fact that we almost always release at about the same time a week. Mm -hmm. It shows the fact that we're always all three of us there for better and for worse. Um, it, show, it, it shows in the fact that we will do ridiculous recordings. You know, the, I have brought recording equipment on vacation in order to record. We try to avoid it, but we'll do it. And again, I'm not trying to say like, oh, woe is me. I'm not outside, you know, digging trenches. I'm not, I'm not putting roofs on houses. Like my life is way easier than it could be. I'm not trying to lose sight of that, but I am trying to say that there is more to it than meets the eye. And, you know, getting the audio set up right as I jiggle my mic deliberately, like getting the audio set up right and, and realizing how to, you know, get your room treated acoustically. You can't see it from, from where the camera is, but behind mm -hmm. my monitor, which is recording this, we have a bunch of acoustic tiles, which don't look bad, but are, but are an odd choice for a dual use office and guest room. Um, but, you know, we do that because it's better for the show. And, mm -hmm. and I think that if one cares, really, really cares about what they do, I like to believe that whether or not you make money on it, whether or not it's popular, it still is clear 
that you gave a crap. And, you know, many years ago, I wrote a post on my on my blog about, you know, what do we do for podcasting? And ultimately, the the executive summary, you know, I can tell you what mic I use, I can tell you this, I can tell you that, but the executive summary is, we just really give a crap. And that kind of guides everything else by really giving a crap. And, and that gets us to 500 episodes. And we're lucky enough that we've had listeners hang on for some of whom for 500 episodes, which is, you know, somebody had done the math, a listener had done the math, and it's like 988 hours of content or something like that, which is absurd, like almost a thousand hours of listening to us. I don't know if I want to listen to myself for a thousand <laughs> hours, but, but I'm so grateful and we're so lucky that people do and, and, and that people find us like yourself and, and stick with us. So it, it, we're very, very lucky. It's really, interesting the way the com you know, that's what I, I love above all else is interviewing I, I got to start doing it when I had the jazz radio show I used to interview mm -hmm. I was really lucky to have some wonderful wonderful jazz artists on and I love talking to people to find out the stories and today the biggest revelation is that you and I kind of have that podcast audio link in common and I thought you were very much going to be on the geek side of app development and the podcast was a happy accident again phrasing yeah. the term carefully but mm -hmm. of course you know you are an audio man you are and what i love and just to reference back to you as a listener to your show it's the intimacy of of the three of you mm -hmm. and yep. those voices in your head through lockdown clearly i know how important podcasts were to yeah. very many people because it was an outside voice coming in and keeping you company but even outside of those weird times it's always been audio for me and it's those three, in your case, those three voices coming into my life on a Thursday night, Friday morning, and I know what to expect. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know the banter, and, and... you know the, you know, the jobby job thing, and of course <laughs> right. we're talking about the, the Teslas, and, you know, he doesn't drive a car, he drives a tablet. You know, you right, kind right, of right. get to know the yep. guys, you get to know the jive between mm -hmm. the three of you, and that, I think, is what makes the show so unique. And, of course, yeah, I, I, and the I skill appreciate you that. have is, is, is making it look easy. That's... Well, and thank you. That's very kind of you. Uh, I, I think, you know, a, a friend of mine, Merlin Mann, who is um, a very, very popular podcaster, probably my favorite podcaster, if I'm honest with you, um, he has said many times about many shows that you might arrive for the topic at hand. You might arrive on our show because you're interested in Apple or whatever the case may be, but it's not the topic that keeps you there. It's the banter, to your point. It's the personalities. It's the relationships. 100%. And for better and worse, we're all very, very close. And sometimes we kill each other. Like, you know, there was a, a portion on the, I think it was the most recent episode where we were really butting heads, the three of us about something and the, the particular content was not important, but it, it was one of the most aggressive times that we've been at each other's throats. And, and I actually asked Marco to cut it out of the released program for uninteresting reasons, but there are times that we'll like really give it to each other. And mm -hmm. we, we, we love each other. We're, we're, we're incredibly proud of each other and close with each other but we are kind of like brothers in that regard you know what i mean where we, you know we're there for each other we care about each other we'll do anything for each other but we'll also be the first to point out each other's foibles and i'll be the first to tell you that you know marco's number one way of fixing a problem is throwing money at it and and john you know is obsessed with some of the most finicky things in the world like john has literally has a stockpile of like four or five cheese graters yes cheese graters that you would grate a block of cheese with because he's just that particular about the one that he likes. And, and, it's, and I have my own foibles. Like I am a big vinyl fan. I don't have near as much as you have, but I am still a big vinyl fan. And, and the two of them would tell you, well, that's garbage. You know, it sounds like dirt. It's a pain in the butt to deal with, which it is, is mostly yep. true, but <laughs> nevertheless, you know, I like it. I like it nevertheless. And so, yeah, you, I think to your point, you stay and you stick around because of the personalities. And I like mm. to think that the three of us, even though we have a special and unique kind of personality, all three of us, you know, if you're into that sort of thing, I think it, it is a lot of fun and it, and it can be a lot of fun. And it's, it's, it's fascinating meeting listeners, which I haven't been able to do in a long time now, but it's funny because it's a very one-sided relationship and, and all they want to do is talk about this thing that happened on the show or this thing that I said, or John said, or Marco said, and I don't have a problem with that, but it's hard not to feel completely selfish or self-obsessed because, you know, I want to ask, well, how did you find the show? How, what, do, what do you enjoy about it? What is interesting about your jobby job? And, and I want to have like these normal conversations. And a lot of times a listener will just be like, oh yeah, I, I work for Microsoft. So the other day on the show, you know, and it, it, it's, it, it's funny because I feel like a turd that we're only spending all this time talking about me and, and it's hard. And I try to tell myself, and then this also sounds kind of turdish, but like, that's what they want want is yeah. to have a moment with the with the person that they've spent so much time with but it's it's a very odd and unusual balancing act to to try to 
be interested in their lives, but also give them that moment that they want where they yeah. got to, you know, hang out with me or Marco or John or all three of us. It's something. their escapism, don't forget. And suddenly if they're yeah. face to face, they've got a chance to speak to somebody like I am now that's been in their yeah. life yeah. weekly for umpteen years. Yeah. And you kind of feel, <laughs> and of course, that's the wonderful thing with audio. I think more than video, you feel you know somebody because the voice is so personal. You know, and I'm, I'm interested to hear your take on that because... Uh, as someone who I, I, mean, I typically listen to podcasts, I do have a handful of channels I subscribe to on YouTube, but I would feel like it would be easier to grab onto somebody from video than it would be audio. And, and you are not the first person to have said that that is not at all true. And I wonder, and I'm curious your take, is it the audio or is it the fact that there's two freaking hours of audio every week? You know what I mean? Like, is it the audio that's the thing or is it that there's so much of it as compared to like a five minute YouTube video that you watch once a week? You know, like, do you feel do you really think it is the audio that is the difference? I think it is. I, I, there was a phrase that I don't think I can claim originality on this. It's called theater of the mind. And, oh, I yeah, think, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, radio is that. And OK, yeah. by all measures, all metrics, podcasts are on demand radio. And yeah. oh, absolutely. It's, it's the fact okay, I've kind of gone to the dirty side now and have used video. <laughs> Not particularly successfully, it could be argued, but I've gone to the dirty side. But, uh, but with, with, with audio, of course, y you build a picture of what that person looks like, where they're sitting. And my mum, bless her, she never wanted to see what radio presenters looked like because in her mind, yeah. <laughs> she had this image of what this man that was talking to her at 10 o'clock yep. at night looked like. Yep. And that was how she wanted the picture and what maybe the studio and everything about it. So by doing what we're doing now, it kind of blows that open and, and suddenly people can see who. So I don't know, I, I, from my point, I would, if you were to release a video version of it, it wouldn't mm -hmm. interest me as much as the audio side. A, the audio is really good quality. So listening to it, right. whether I'm listening in studio, headphones, studio, monitors or on yeah, AirPods, yeah. it's good quality. That obviously is a must. But equally, it is that the three of you the way you gel. And as you say, the way you do go at one another sometimes, because I'd still sit there, oh, no, no, this isn't going to go well. But that's part of the yep. entertainment. That's part of yep, the journey yep. of listening to the show. So no, the audio is what wins it for me 100%. That's interesting. I mean, I'm not trying to imply that you're wrong in any stretch of the, of the imagination. It's just, it's, it's, it, I don't, I haven't had the opportunity to very often to have a show that I've listened to for a long, long time and then meet the the person who's presenting it, right? Like I've I've had shows that I've listened to for years and years that I have known the 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 hosts, but typically if that's happened with me, it's been that I have known the host short I like I've met the host shortly after or even before the podcast started. So I haven't had the experience of like meeting the host like Roman Mars of 99% Invisible, for example, you know, just to pick out some from the air. Like I, I don't really know what he looks like. I've seen a picture of him. And I will say, to your point, he does not jive with his voice. Like, the, I, his voice and his picture are two very different things in my world. Like, they don't match at all. Um, but I, I haven't had the opportunity to, like, meet him and have that or, or even really watch a video of him and have that experience, like, turned on its head. So um, I, I, I'd be... I'd be interested to see if I have that opportunity at some point, you know, what that would feel like. I guess actually the closest has been CGP Grey, which I don't know if you or your listeners are familiar with. But um, CGP Grey is an American that has lived in London for many, many years. Um, he, is a, he was a school teacher for several years and now is a professional YouTuber and podcaster. He actually has a similar thing with YouTube and podcasts as I do with app development and podcasts. But anyway, um, all of his videos, he's never shown his face and his videos are animated generally. And um, typically there's like a little stick figure circle with like glasses and that's CGP Grey. Um, and that is his name. Like that's not a, 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 a pseudonym or anything. Mm -hmm. But um, but anyways, I had the opportunity to meet Grey in person several years ago now. And that was, to your point, pretty freaking weird because <laughs> like, I've, I've listened Isn't to his it? shows. I've listened to, uh, or I've watched his videos. Um, as an American, he became well, or I first heard of him when he did a very old video now on explaining the United Kingdom and, you know, there's the United can. Kingdom and, 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 and there's, <laughs> you know, there's Australia and then there's Ireland and Northern Ireland. And no, they're not the same thing. You dumb Americans. They're actually two different things. And, and so he did this whole big video on that. And if you listen to it and watch it now, like the, the fidelity of it is garbage. He sounds like dirt, like the, the, the animation is not great, but you can see the start of what he's doing now. And, and if you haven't checked out his videos, they really are magnificent. They're, they're typically educational uh, videos and they're really, really great. Um, again, CGP, gray a g-r-e-y um well i had the opportunity to meet him and that was that was a little bit of a mind screw seeing because he has such a distinct he's such a 
a distinct voice. I was going to say unique. It's not that it's unique, but it's just this this very distinct voice. And and hearing it come out of the body that uh, the, the, out of his body was very unusual. And his his persona, his physical persona, did not match what I expected. Uh, what I expected him to look like. Like he does have glasses. He got that part right. And you know his little animations. Did but, it in any way ruin uh, it for you? I, I wouldn't say it ruined, well, ruined it, but it changed it. Word, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, fair. It definitely changed it, for sure. It absolutely yeah. changed it. Um, and sometimes when I'm, if I have the opportunity to be around him and talk to him, which I haven't in a couple of years, sometimes I'll like think to myself, oh, there's a YouTube guy. And I consider Gray a friend at this point. You know, we don't know each other super well, but I, I think we're friends. Uh, and and it's occasionally even still, I'll be like, oh, there's the YouTube guy again. Like it just like the, the it mode switches in my brain sometimes, which is really wild. Yeah, I mean, it's, I totally get what you mean. And, and I say, I know when you and I were organizing this, we weren't mm -hmm. sure whether they're going to video it or not, which actually, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. I, I want to make a couple more points about the podcast. And we'll talk about St. Jude's, which I know is a charity very yeah. mm -hmm. close and personal to you. But with the podcast, how do you mechanically go about it? And do you like have a, a Slack or something? You, you, you kind of have, not script, but you each put in elements each week. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. begin to build it up and then pre-show your get together, talk, say, right, we'll talk about, I don't know, iPhone 14 for the first 40 minutes and whatever. Is that kind of where it builds? <laughs> you, you were right on until you said for about 40 minutes, because we are not that <laughs> professional. Um, but no, the, the, the broad strokes of what you're saying is exactly right. Like we, we do have a Slack channel where we talk from time to time during the week, but there's a Google Docs document where it's just been living for 10 years now and that's our mm -hmm. show notes as we call it mm -hmm. um which is we need better words for this because we call the stuff that just belongs to us the show notes and yet we call the stuff that's in the rss Bonded. feed with links in it we call that the show, show notes. notes we really need like two different words for that but anyway um but yeah so we have the the show document that that we use internally if you will and we'll just add stuff all three of us will add stuff to that during the week and then we do in the last year or so we've we've come to do what john calls pre-flight and we'll quickly before we go live we'll walk through the document and say okay where do we think we're going to stop and then you know what do we think we'll get through and okay, what is, if we have a little extra time, what are we going to bring in that we wouldn't have talked about otherwise? And um, we'll do that for like two or three minutes before we go live and then we'll, we'll go ahead and record. But in terms of the, the physical, if you will, process of recording, uh, we all have, you know, obviously studio microphones, um, which the visual people can see uh, mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, we all have studio microphones and we record locally, which is what I'm doing now as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we record locally. And we get on Zoom now for the last year or two, but previously we would get on uh, a Skype, almost at Slack, but we would get on Skype and we would just talk, you know, it would be a regular phone call, no video. We never use video. Um, Even between the three I think them. it was, mm, you don't need never video. do. No. Yep. Um, and the part of the reason we do that, and I've made this mistake many times because I'm not used to having video, is you don't think about the audio only people when you're talking visually to someone mm -hmm. and so like i'm hey i made reference to something behind me earlier which the audio people could probably piece together i was pointing at my closet doors but the video people could see that immediately mm -hmm. well when you don't have video at all you have to you know emote if you will oh these closet doors that are behind me you know what i mean and so it, it forces you to do a little bit better job of being clear for audio people what it is you're talking about. And so for that reason, we don't do video for, at all, like not even oh, between so the three of us. Oh, to encourage you all to make sure that the banter is correct right. for audio listeners, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Because you can there are bread well, and can't you? You can what? Listen live as well. Because I, yes, I see something yes. come up on Twitter now on a Thursday mm -hmm. night when you, you guys are going live. Yeah, I, well, it's a live, piss I need poor... to do that. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a terrible time for you guys in the, in the UK or you <laughs> folks in the UK, but uh, it's about eight o'clock our time in the evening, which is something like what, two in the morning for two you? Two in the morning, yeah. Like yeah, I keep um, hours, which is why I see it. Yeah. Well, fair. <laughs> um, Bags under the eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you don't want to be starting a two or three hour podcast at two in the morning, I can assure you. But um, but yeah, so we do broadcast live. Um, Marco has set all that up on his end. Um, and so he'll take the stream that he gets from us. And he actually uses, I believe, Audio Hijack, which is an app mm -hmm. by a company yeah, called yeah. Rogue Amoeba. Uh, Rogue Amoeba. Running, yeah. Uh, yeah, same. And uh, he uses Audio Hijack to actually make himself sound crummier. So it matches what the two of us sound like coming into his Zoom feed. Mm -hmm. And so he'll make himself sound a little bit worse. And that matches the two of us. And that gets rebroadcast so you can listen live. And for many years, a handful of really devoted listeners 
would schedule like audio hijack to record that and make themselves like a bootleg so they could listen to the unedited version of the show when we correct mistakes and mm -hmm. when i accidentally swear or whatever the case may be because it's always me that seems to be doing that um and you know occasionally we will cut a segment from the show either because it's not interesting or because one of us has asked the others to and people loved getting these bootlegs and so around pandemic time when everyone's marketing budgets were being cut and thus ad spends were being cut and thus our income was being cut we were like well crap we need to do something, do something to make up for this loss and we figured okay let's do membership which was starting to become in vogue at the time and uh, at first we offered ad free versions of the show and then in an unusual move for Marco I, I think he would agree that, that he was wrong because John and I were badgering him like let's just do a bootleg let's just do a bootleg ourselves rather than make people you know do all this monkey work to to do it on, by hand and Marco was digging his heels and digging his heels in. And this comes back to what we were talking about earlier. He is so proud and justifiably so proud of the audio that it like hurt him to release like a crummy, a subpar. unedited, a subpar version of the show. But John and I kept saying, no, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm telling you, people are going to love it. People are going to love it. And it turns out that people do love it. And, and we were right about that um, in a very un unusual time that, that Marco was, I think, just, just dead wrong, which is, again, I can't stress enough, very, very un unlike him. But... Uh, we did this membership thing and and here again like th that's a, giving a crap and then um just in the last few weeks uh we for our 500th episode we wanted to do something just for the members which we yeah, had never really done any yeah, any real this. exclusive and you know some of our peers what they have done is they've launched shows where you get the main part of the show for free and then there's like some bonus content after the fact. And we kind of have the same format on ATP. We have a more formal version of the show that we consider the show. Mm -hmm. And then we play this little like tune that a friend of ours wrote. And then we have what we call the after show, which is more casual. And we don't really care if we talk about cars or talk about stuff that ostensibly nobody would really care about. So like if you tune out during the after show, you're not going to hurt our feelings. You know, it's kind of the BS part of the show. Um, but we it, we it felt wrong to take that away that what, what, we, what we had already been giving people for free. So we didn't feel that was an option. And so we wanted to instead do something additive and do something where we're giving you something you wouldn't have already otherwise had. And so what we did for the 500th episode is each of us made the other two watch a movie. Um, Marco made the two of us watch My Cousin Vinny, which I had never seen. I made the other two watch uh, a movie called The Rundown, which is with The Rock and uh, an actor, Sean William Scott, that you might know from the American Pie movies, The Stifler. Um, and we haven't yet released or announced what the... Um, what the last movie is, but John picked something that neither of us had seen. Uh, and so we, we talked about each of these, we called it ATP movie club and we did just a three run mini series just for members of us, you know, reviewing these and talking about these films. And we wanted to do that, you know, because we honestly, we wanted to juice the membership numbers a bit, but we also wanted to celebrate the members that have already there. Mm. And we wanted to give them a little and bonus something. that, that, that again was additive that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And, and, you know, you didn't have to pay extra for like a second tier of membership or anything like that. We just, you had to be a member. And if you're not in a position that you can or want to pay for ATP, you're not losing out on anything. Like it's not, it's not like we talked about the iPhone 14 review privately or something like that. It's just some something fun and goofy to, that we did off on the side and well i think hopefully we'll do that maybe once a year or something like that in, in years going forward we have no formal plans sitting here now but um we have a lot of really extravagant ideas and we don't have a lot of very good simple ideas so we'll see what ends up happening because none of us have the time or the energy for a lot of the extravagant ones but we'll see what we do Funny enough, I heard you talk about the on the, the 500th episode was playing, and this is absolute mm -hmm. truth. Last Saturday, when I was in the car driving over to pick up my iPhone 14, so I heard about oh. your movie <laughs> extravaganza and listening yeah. to the 500th episode when you were talking about the 9,000 mm -hmm. hours, and I was stuck in a traffic jam waiting to go and pick up my iPhone 14. So there you go, forever that will be logged in a synergy yep, with yep. my phone. And that's yep. that's see that is what podcasts do, and that's why I know it's your album yep. art as well in the car on the on, mm -hmm. on because I've got Apple CarPlay, it shows mm -hmm. up on the screen and the album art. Yep. I got enough how that changed and i asked my my audio my podcast host is that a feature and they said no no we're thinking about trying to code that in but we heard it's quite popular mm -hmm. i said yeah it's it's good you need to look at that and the funny the funny story behind that is we were just beaten up 
by a bunch of Germans. And this is the hand of God. This is the truth. We were just beaten up by a bunch of Germans that were like devout chapter people. Like they just swear that you're doing it wrong. If you don't have chapters, it's it's, and there was one guy, I think it's Tim Pritlove is his name. I might have that wrong. It's been a few, few years since I thought about this, but it's apparently he's like, and I don't mean this dismissively, but he's like the Joe Rogan of German podcasts. And I, I, I that's a terrible analogy, but I just, in terms of popularity, not in mm-hmm. terms of content. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> and so he, he, I guess was a devout chapter person and, and all these Germans were like tweeting at us constantly. Like you gotta add chapters, gotta add chapters. It makes it so much better, blah, blah, blah. And we, all three of us resisted it for the longest time. Oh, you gotta add chapters. You gotta add chapters. No, 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 we don't need chapters. Just listen to the show. If you fast forward, fast forward, whatever. I don't care. Just no, we're not adding chapters. It's more work. It's not additive. Well, I mean, strictly speaking, it's added, but no. And then eventually Marco, I think it was Marco came around and was like, all right, maybe I'll do it for like a couple of episodes and see what we think. And it turns out that the Germans were right. And not only is it useful for the Germans who are devout chapter people, but it's also kind of nice. You know, if you really honestly don't care about car talk, then skip the chapter. If mm-hmm. you don't care about the iPhone 14, then skip the chapter. And Marco, um, in, in the Marco way, decided, oh, I can make a lot out of this. And I can make little in-jokes with the chapter art, like you brought up a couple times. And, you know, is it required to look at the chapter art for every single chapter? Absolutely not. In fact, I would argue that most, but most times it doesn't even change. But there are some good, fun jokes in there or, or visual aids in, in the chapters, in the chapter art, if you have a podcast client that's capable of playing it and showing it. Um, but yeah, I don't know what you're using for hosting, but you could take the edited file out of Logic or GarageBand or what have you, and then sl- use Marco's app to slap the chapter art in there and then upload that MP3 that too, yeah. up, yep. to, up to your host because it's all embedded within the MP3. That's you know part of the movie magic, if you will. Mm. Um, so you could do this even without the host's help. You would just need to grab Marco's app. With and app. If, if I, I will try to remember to, to send you a link afterwards. Yeah, do. Recording. I'd like to put all of those links in the, in the show notes. Yeah. That was the funny yeah, thing yeah, absolutely, we were talking earlier on. You, I was, you were talking my world. It was like, yeah, put it in the show notes. I thought, yeah. <laughs> I'm not used to talking to somebody else doing this same gig. So, and, right. be- and better and more professionally. So, let's talk uh, yeah, lastly that. then about uh, St. Jude's. This is a yeah. charity that you've been mentioning on the podcast uh, over the last, I think, three or four episodes. I know it's a mm-hmm. children's cancer charity that you're very close to and you've raised some good money for it recently. Yeah. How yeah. Did so, you uh, involved so- with that. So a dear friend of ours, Stephen Hackett, he's one of the co-founders of Relay, which I've brought up a couple of times. Um, that's where my other show is as a part of that network. And uh, Stephen happens to have grown up in Memphis, Tennessee. And in Memphis, Tennessee, is St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which because the American healthcare system is fundamentally broken, and as is many other things in America, but that's neither here nor there, um, we have to pay, you know, we are compelled to pay for insurance if we want to be able to afford health care. Um, oftentimes that's mated with your job, which makes changing jobs very squishy and interesting not to go on a big tangent. Um, but in many ways, I'm jealous of national, the, what is it, National, national health, health Service? Is yep, that right? Yep, yep, um, right? I'm very, very jealous in many, many ways. Uh, so not only your accents, but your wonderful health care. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, um, one of the great things about St. Jude is they never charge their patients' families a dime. And again, I'm sure if you're a, living in a civilized country, that's like, yeah, okay. But when you live in a barbaric place like America, that's actually very, very exciting and interesting. And Stephen's eldest child, uh, 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 he he was afflicted with childhood cancer at like six months old. So can you imagine being a new parent? You have a six-month-old, and next thing you know, you, your kid is being you're, – you're being told your kid has cancer. Like, he, the, the kid is barely sitting up at this point, and, and, and he had a brain tumor. And so uh, it, Stephen was incredibly lucky to live in Memphis, where St. Jude is, and he was able to get treatment, millions of dollars of treatment for his – son at St. Jude and he paid not a dime. And, you know, if, if he didn't live in Memphis, my, my understanding is he would have probably, the family would have been flown to Memphis and that would have been at no cost to them. I, I believe that's right. I might be lying mm-hmm. to you, but if I am, it's not on purpose. Um, and so because of that, you know, I think Stephen justifiably feels feels indebted to St. Jude, not because of what they say or not because of like, you know, they've made him feel bad, but like, look, I, you know, Stephen can say, I have a platform and for better and for worse, we generally, Stephen and myself, you know, we, we talk to people who have enough money to buy an iPhone, who have enough money in some cases to buy an iPhone annually, which is a pretty big waste of money, if I'm honest. And so 
you know, we have, we have a platform where we talk to people that probably have a few bucks to scrape together. And we, and we can ask for a few of those bucks to go to St. Jude. And it's hard to argue with a, with a charity and with a foundation or an organization whose purpose in life is to prevent all children everywhere, not just in America, but everywhere from dying of childhood cancer. Like you should not, I forget that they have a very good turn of phrase, but you know, you should not have to worry about healthcare and, and, and about being healthy in the dawn of your life. Like that's just not something that should be a thing. And so St. Jude is doing whatever they can to make that better. And what's wonderful about St. Jude, other than the no billing thing is that they, they don't hoard their research. They don't, they don't keep it for themselves. They, they spread their research around worldwide. And so there's no doubt in my mind that there are kids in the UK whose lives were saved on account of the research that was performed at St. Jude. And so September is national, uh, I think it's national, maybe it's international, uh, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. And so for the last four years, Stephen and Mike um, have come together, sometimes physically, sometimes remotely, but have come together to raise money uh, for St. Jude. And, and the, the broader Stephen and Mike Relay FM podcasting universe has gotten behind it as well. And so over the last few years, um, you know, ATP has donated what I like to think of as a pretty decent sum of money um, in, in solidarity for, for Stephen and his family and to help like jazz the kind of get the, you know, prime the pump, if you will, and get people donating. And we've been phenomenally lucky that on account of either Relay or ATP or both, we've had a bunch of people donate literally thousands and thousands of dollars of their own hard earned money mm. in this incredibly selfless act to, to try to prevent children from having, you know, d d d fatal illness. Illnesses, really fatal cancers, and and it's even though I have been lucky enough not to experience it myself, it's such an easy cause to get behind. You know, like mm -hmm. it's it's not like you know I have a very weird eye condition that that you know people haven't found a cure for, and I could get behind like oh let's raise money for keratoconus, but nobody really cares about that but me. Like and and that's fine, but almost everyone, parent or not can care about kids not dying from cancer, cancer right? Yeah. So, uh, and so it's a really, really great way to raise money. And, they, and you know, St. Jude raises money all year, but September is the big push. And as we're recording, it's, you know, the tail end of September. And so uh, Relay breaking news, you know, do, 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 do. Uh, Relay has raised $2 million over Oof. the course of four years. Uh, $2 million uh, has been raised by the Relay families um, for, for St. Jude. And just this year, I believe we've crossed $500,000. And that's just in a month. You know, just in just in a month of the year. And that's because, you know, I can't say it enough. All of our listeners are such incredibly and I, and I know I speak for you as well, are so incredibly wonderful, uh, kind and giving people to give not only their money, which is an extremely precious resource, but more important than that, to give their time. Like you've been hanging on for this call for like an hour now. And that is incredible, an incredible gift to give your time. And the second most incredible gift after that that you can give is your money. And, and so many of our listeners are giving both to either us and or St. Jude. And it's such an incredible thing. So if you're listening to this and if you happen to want to donate money, even if it isn't September, uh, stjude.org slash relay, S-T-J-U-D-E dot org slash relay. And we would be overjoyed. And, and you can even put in the notes, you know, how you were sent. And, 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 and you, know, you, can, you can take credit for the show um, and, and, and say, you know, that's what got you here but um but it, it's incredible it's incredible privilege and pleasure to be able to do this every september and i'm really hopeful um Stephen and Mike do the, what they call the podcast-a-thon, uh, where they get on, on the air, they broadcast via Twitch for eight hours, and it's such a train wreck in the best possible way. And I've told them for several years, like Memphis is a long drive from where I am in Virginia. It's something like eight to ten hours. Um, and it, But I've told them, I'm coming. Like, one of these years... I don't care if I'm invited. Like I'm just gonna crash. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just gonna crash. <laughs> that got real squishy once COVID hit because you know they're a hospital. They need they need to be careful about these sorts of things. Um, but I'm telling you, like next year, the year after, I'm in, baby. I'm going. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna crash that. I'm gonna crash that party whether they like it or not. And obviously, I'll make sure I'll ask you to give all those links for St. Jude's afterwards so mm -hmm. we can put it all in the show notes so if people do want to mm -hmm. donate, that they can do. Because that, as yep. you say, it's one of those universal things, childhood cancer, you know, who couldn't yep. be behind that? And just before <laughs> exactly. wrapping and letting you go mm -hmm. and get on with your, your Monday, um, I meant to ask on the podcast, do you always record remotely or have you ever all been in one studio together? 
A couple of times we've done it in person. Uh, the overwhelming, the simple answer to your question is no. We're, we always do it remotely, but it's no asterisk, right? Uh, so we used to, again, another thing that COVID has ruined, um, we used to, in, in, in June, for the big conference that I made passing reference to earlier, we would do a live show where we would go to a theater in either San Francisco or San Jose in later years, and all three of us would sit on a stage and we would record a show in front of you know a few hundred or sometimes a couple thousand people. And John hated it. Uh, Marco, I think, was kind of ambivalent about it because he had a lot of administri administrivia to deal with, with the microphones that he would bring. Like, he would bring the microphones, he would bring the audio equipment, somewhat because he's nice, somewhat because he just wants that level of control. Um, but he would have to deal with all that. And uh, like I said, I would just basically show up and do my thing. Uh, it's funny, though, that John hated it so much because I actually think that John is much funnier than people give him credit for and is so fast, particularly live when he can feed off of like the, the audience. He is stunningly funny. And I don't know if that always comes across on the show, but he is very fast and very, very, very witty. I and find so him, he's, I, he's got a dry wit as well, which I love. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, as, as, as someone from the, you know, the greater UK area, I would imagine that you would enjoy a dry <laughs> wit. But, um, but anyways, uh, when we're in front of us, in front of an audience, like I find that to be my favorite episode of the year because you get that energy back. And it's funny, when, when I was younger, you know, my family doesn't really believe in reincarnation or anything, but my mom always would joke, like, if I were to come back, I want to be like a musician or something or, or like a stage actor. So I can, you know, they can say, you know, welcome to the stage, you know, Mrs. Liss or you know, Janelle, Janelle Liss. And, 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 and she would come out and, and all these people would be like screaming for me, says my mom, you know, and, and, and I, I just think that would be amazing. So I've heard this since I was like five. And it only happened once a year, but for one time a year, you know, welcome to the stage, you know, Mark Orman, mm -hmm. John Syracuse and Casey List of the Accidental Tech Podcast. And people were mostly yelling for John and occasionally for Marco and me, but most of them were there for John. Oh, that's modesty, OK. At least a little face. a little bit, a little bit for the two of us. And and I got it. It's, it's a cool feeling. And I love to be honest, I kind of love that I would get that once. Like I would have that yeah. one time each year where I'm, quote unquote, famous and then the I go back to show. regular life, and, and yeah, and then that was it. That the, the, you know, I've gotten re recognized in Richmond a handful of times in ten years, but it's very, very rare. And away from the studio, away from the mic, away from app development, mm -hmm. what do we find you doing? What's your big ways of hanging out? How do you relax, chill? Uh, that's a that's a Vinyl really good question. Is, is something you enjoy? Yeah, yeah. I I don't know if we'll have time to talk about that today. Maybe maybe I'll invite myself back for another episode at some Please point. Do. But um, but I do I do enjoy vinyl a lot. Um, I don't play it that often to be honest with you because it is fussy and it takes a while to set everything up and so on and so forth. But I do enjoy music and vinyl. Um, I grew up in a household where music was always playing. Like my parents, my my mom can kind of play the guitar, but um, mm -hmm. my dad can't play anything. I joke that the only thing I can play with any efficacy is the stereo. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I, I'm one of those people that like silence kind of weirds me out. And so um, I, I'm not a Federico Vitici where I will sit there with a bespoke set of headphones and just listen. You know, I'm not quite that level, but I definitely always have music on. Um, I have two little kids, so I'm always you know trying to hang with them and entertain them. Um, we, we, when we can, we do love to travel. Um, one of the great things about America is that it's pretty big. And so you can you can see a lot while staying within America. Now, that also has problems because a lot of Americans don't realize that they're places other than america but nevertheless <laughs> um you know it, it, it does have its perks and so we do like like to travel quite a bit and now that the whole family is vaccinated finally um because my youngest is four and a half now and so she she wasn't eligible until very very recently um now that we're all vaccinated we're already starting to make plans for summer for you know maybe getting on a plane for the first time in two and a half years three years mm -hmm. whatever it's been and and you know doing that sort of thing um but I, i'm also a tinkerer like even even when i'm not writing code for for work i i oftentimes will do some sort of silly code related project um during the pandemic i i decided to make the world's most convoluted and over the top garage door monitoring system um where i where i took a couple of very very tiny computers called raspberry pis uh, i i used two of them in concert to basically light a single led in my bedroom incredibly convoluted and over the top and stupid but i had a lot of fun doing it and so uh doing any sort of tinkering like that is it, electronics or you know code related tinkering is, is something i quite enjoy um and i don't know i i feel like that's a very boring answer but just you know between being a dad and 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 having you know like kind of sort of two jobs it keeps most of my time busy um so yeah, that's that's kind of a cop out, but I, I guess that's kind of the no, truth no, these days. Uh, two, two kids, yeah, absolutely, two young kids will keep you <laughs> will keep you on your toes. That's for sure, indeed.
Yep. So mm -hmm. I've waited, for, as you know, for a very long time to get you on, Casey. It's been fascinating. And it's gone, and this yes. is, I said earlier on, what I love about it, it's gone a totally different direction. I have copious amounts of notes here and we haven't really touched them <laughs> because and Sorry. that's the great thing with meeting people and talking to people yep. the conversations you know we said at the start didn't we how long should we talk for well let's just see how it goes turns out you know you either get on with somebody or you don't and if you don't yep, yep. it kind of ends after 15 minutes of polite talk <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> hour and 15 in but no it's great you know i haven't had to look at those at all and we've just chatted and to find out that you're predominantly a podcast i mean i'll have even more enthusiasm now for looking forward to atp each week because you know i know the passion that you'll it comes through clearly but knowing now firsthand what goes into it and it's, so it's a little mini dream come true for me today i'll be putting loads and loads of links in the show notes where they can find your podcast if they're not already listening to it to st jude as we mentioned to the other podcast you mentioned maybe you'll be uh, kind enough to send me over links to some of your favorite podcasts so people yep. can explore and listen and all i can say is thank you and i look forward to oh, okay. thursday I am I am excited to uh, be on the show with you. And, and yeah, uh, you were very kind to me because when you first reached out, I was like, well, I can't do it right now because school's starting and I'm a mess. And then I was, wait, wait, wait. Did you want to do video? Because yeah. I'm not doing video. <laughs> and and you were very gracious and very kind. And then it occurred to me on account of the podcastathon and St. Jude stuff, for those who are visual people, you know, I've got the, the bed behind me. And normally that's just full of you know, trinkets and not literal garbage, but figurative garbage. And, but I had to clean all that up for the darn podcastathon. I was like, wait, wait, wait. All right. Now is the time. Is let's the strike while the iron's hot. Like, let's get on video. Let's do it now because this might, might be your only right chance. Time. So, yeah, right. well, so, if we do it audio so, only next time, that's equally fine. Oh, no, no, no. We'll, we'll you figure it out. But talk, if you want to come back and talk audio and vinyl and music, then we oh, can do I'm, another podcast. I'm ready. All about I'm ready. that. Yeah, Casey. we'll definitely do that. And, and I can hopefully, I, I will clean up the bed for you one more time. I promise. <laughs> Casey, thank you so much. It's been great chatting with you. No, you as well. Thank you so much. The pleasure is, is definitely mine. Awesome. Thank you.